It's communion Sunday, so I know I'm supposed to merely offer a meditation, which is a way of reminding the preacher not to go on too long. <laughs> but the problem is, this is such an incredible story, and I just have exciting news to tell about being alive now that I've been thinking about this story for a week. Let me just say a couple of things. You, I hope, were listening during Cindy's prayer because she mentioned the 12 days of Christmas. Today is Epiphany, and I know that the way Christians have evolved now, we just celebrate Christmas on Christmas, but Christmas is supposed to be a season, and there are 12 days of Christmas. Last night was Twelfth Night. And that's why William Shakespeare wrote a play called Twelfth Night. To have a funny entertainment at the party you have to end the Christmas season. So last night was Twelfth Night, the twelfth day of Christmas, and today is Epiphany. And some people call this even Little Christmas. And if you happen to be born in a good Italian family, you might still get a gift this morning, right? Amen. But Baptists are too cheap. So here we are uh, with this story of the wise men. So if you still have your Bibles, it won't really help to be looking, but I do like you may want to have them open just to know I'm not making this stuff up. Because I've, I've got some points to make and I know what they are. But first I just want us to remember the story. So after the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, that's how it begins. And this is going to be my kind of translation. So just hang in there. You can do that, right? All right. After the birth of Jesus of Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. That's the word in the Bible originally. Magi. That's a funny word. It's not a word we use every day. It is related to our word for magician. Who were these characters? This is not an occupation you can study for at Olin College to be a magi. This is not like an accountant or a truck driver or a doctor or a lawyer. This is a different kind of creature, a magi. It's part prophet, part holy man, part magician, part astronomer. They had folks like that in the olden days, magi. And so, because it's an unusual word, sometimes we translate it and describe these characters as wise men. And sometimes we've even made them into kings. But it says, I'm telling you here in Matthew, they're magi. And how many of them are there? It's a trick question. It doesn't say. So this is just like so many other beautiful mysteries in the Bible. Inquiring minds want to know. And over the course of centuries, we have embroidered the story and made even new stories. So now we say there are three wise men because at the end of the story, there are three gifts. But it just says wise men in the plural. It says they came from the east. Where's that? Here's another funny thing. The word, I know you're going to get bored with this, the word in Greek, but this, it makes me happy. So will you bear with me? You know what the word in Greek is there? It says wise men from Anatolia. Do you know that word? Anatolia is an unusual word. And we use it to refer to the mainland of Turkey. Have you, come on. Go way back. Haven't you ever, ever, ever heard the word Anatolia? Somebody give me a little affirmation. Yes. All right. It's what they used to... Yeah, they, that's what you call the mainland of Turkey because there's parts of Turkey 
that are in Europe, uh, across the Aegean, and then that part of Turkey which is on the mainland of Western Asia is called Anatolia. So it says the wise men came from Anatolia. This is the Greek language. To the Greeks, anything east of Greece was the east, was Anatolia. So now we have traditions, the wise men are from Persia. I've read scholars that think maybe they were from Jordan. I mean, they are strangers in town. We have no idea where they came from. And part of the beautiful embroidery of Christian tradition is giving them backstories and giving them biographies and imagining where they came from and even giving them names. I wish I had some candy to hand out. Who knows the names of the three wise men in Christian tradition? Casper, Melchior, and Balthazar. Go figure. Now, come on. Has someone at least heard that sometime and they know I'm not making it up? So, isn't it, the, the incredible thing is, there is this story in Matthew, and it has begotten even more stories. And every time it gets told, people fill in the blanks and add more details. It's as if there's this crash that begins with Matthew, and each generation adds a new character. Until finally, we are all in that crash gathered at the manger. Here's another thing I'm not going to explain, and you'd have to go to seminary to get me to talk about it, but I am telling you, this is Matthew. There are wise men. Do you see any shepherds there? No. The shepherds are in Luke's version of the birth story. Matthew has wise men. Luke has shepherds. Go figure. Okay. So the Magi come saying, where is the boy king of the Jews? We've seen his star in Anatolia, in the east. And we've come to bow down to him, it says. This is important. I'm going to come back to this. They say, we have come to bow down before a king. There is someone here we recognize is more powerful than us. Someone before whom we just let go and bow down. When King Herod heard this, it says, and in your version, does it say he was frightened? Um, in the original, it says he was unsettled. He was stirred up. It's the verb you use if you were to throw a rock in a pond. You have the placid surface of the water, and then all of a sudden, boom. Boom. That placid surface has been broken. This is very important. King Herod was doing just fine. King Herod built palaces. King Herod built great cities. There's a, there was an ancient town called Herodian, which means Herodville. He was a big shot. He was responsible for a lot of great things. But when these wise men show up and are inquiring about a boy king, someone has thrown a rock through his palace window. All of a sudden, he's upset. And it says, all Jerusalem with him. And then he gathered all the high priests and the scribes of the people and asked to them where the anointed one, the Christos, the Christ, was to be born. And they said to him, Bethlehem, and then there's a quote from the prophet Micah. And then here's the next part. I'm not sure which verse this is. Then Herod, I think your version said summoned. That's what Cindy read. Herod, Herod summoned the wise men. But what it says is Herod secretly called the magi, the wise men, to find out the time of the star and then he sent them to Bethlehem saying I want you to go find this child and then what does Herod say and report back so I can go 
bow down to him. The wise men came. This is very important to the way Matthew's telling the story. You've got to pay attention. Matthew says, hey Jeff, Matthew says, the wise men came from a long way away to bow down to the child. Your version said pay homage. That's no good. Bow down. And now Herod says, uh, hey guys, if you find the child, let me know so I can come and bow down. Maybe I'll just stop and make my point about this right now. You know, Herod doesn't want to bow down to the child. Herod wants a photo op. <laughs> this is that nauseating epiphany we get every election cycle where all those liars in high places dress up and go to church to get their picture taken. And the liars I vote for too. This is a kind of false worship. It's a show. Let me know so I can go bow down. You get that? Can you hear that? You've seen it a hundred times. So we just hold our noses and vote. And after hearing the king, they departed and there was the star. They saw the star again. They caught it. Uh, orbit again and it kept moving ahead of them that's the image it kept moving ahead of them and all of a sudden it stopped that's what it says and it stopped over the place where the child was and when they saw the star had stopped they had very great joy what's it say in your Bibles They rejoiced exceedingly. It says they had very great joy. In fact, it says literally they had mega joy. Mega is a Greek word for very. It says they had mega joy. Now, this is another point I'm going to get to in a second, okay? But let's just pause. The same event, the coming of the Christ, for King Herod, it is the rock which disturbs the placid surface of his life. For the wise men, it's great joy. It's the same event. For some people, it's upsetting, disturbing. For others, it's joyful. They entered the house. They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt and they bowed down. This is the third time we've seen bowed down. It says at the beginning, we're going to bow down before the child. King Herod says, oh, if you find him, let me know because I want to bow down. And now finally we've reached the end of the journey. It says they saw the child, they saw Mary, and they bowed down. They worshiped. And then the next verse just kills me. It's so powerful. It says, really, in the original, and then they opened. And then they opened. In a minute, we're going to get to what they opened. But this is so important. When you have actually worshipped, when you have had an honest encounter with something more, you open. You open. Um, and then they opened their treasure chest. Now, you're gonna, you won't believe this. You know what that word is in Greek, their treasure chest? Thesaurus. You've heard of a thesaurus all your life. A thesaurus is a treasure chest of words. The Greek word for treasure chest is thesaurus. So it says they opened up their thesauruses. 
and they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. We got to pause here. Gold is gold, okay? Can I assume we all know gold? Who's got gold right now? On them. Who's wearing it? Okay, we got gold. Susan's got gold. Oh, that's a great song too. I won't go into it. You got gold inside you, but we won't go there. Frankincense. Take off the frank. What's the word? Incense. It means a fancy special kind of incense. And myrrh. Myrrh, a gum, a tree gum used in ointments and lotions. Oh, you know, I'm always disorganized. You know what I wanted to do this morning? I wanted to burn some incense so you could get a sense for that. We could pretend that's pure gold, right? And then I thought, let's have some lotion. And we can give each other hand massages. And we can feel the myrrh. These are such precious things in an ancient world. And I know you're not supposed to say things like this in church. We always tell the seminarians, don't ever mention taking a shower or using the bathroom from the pulpit. <laughs> because when you do, people will all of a sudden... But this is a world without deodorant. This is a world without mouthwash. Do you understand that? So you know what's precious? Things that smell good. Things that feel good. Balms. So that's the gift. And then finally, and having been warned in a dream, don't return to Herod. They left by a different road for their own country. Okay? Now, quickly, let me get my points in. And then we got to get out of here because we got Lord's Supper today. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the contrasting reactions. The coming of the Christ child for Herod scares him, frightens him, rocks his world, disturbs the surface of his life. Because Herod likes to pretend he is in control. He likes to be king. He's got things going his way. He doesn't want a new regime. He does not want a change. When the Magi see the Christ child, they're filled with exceeding joy. The same event scares some people to death and is what others have been waiting for their whole lives. Now, the first thing we can do here is say, aren't you glad you're not one of those Herods? You know, the big shots, the powerful, for whom change is scary. Why do they want anything to change? They're comfortable. And yet, Christ comes to the poor, to the people who've been waiting for a new king. So that's a nice sermon. At seminary, we call that liberation theology. But there's another thing. What about the Herod in each of us? There is a part of us that just wants nothing to change, even if it's dead. We get used to our illnesses. We get accustomed to our ruts. And the last thing we want to do is to have to face change, the new. And it absolutely is a rock that upsets the surface of our lives. But don't you know, don't be not afraid. The new thing is going to bring you great joy if you can trust it. That's the first thing in this text. The second thing I want to draw our attention to is the attitudes toward worship. The wise men come to bow down to the child. 
Herod says he does. He wants to bow down. But all Herod wants to do is get something. In this case, he wants to secure his rule. He wants to know where the child is, So, because what's going to happen in the next story? He's going to try to kill it. Something new, Herod wants to kill it. Then at the end, the wise men come and they worship. How do we know our worship isn't just a photo op? How do we know our worship isn't just a show we put on? I mean, as I say these things, please, I pray to God I'm not sounding holier than thou. Because I don't know you as well as I know me. I'm here to say I'm the biggest hypocrite in Middlesex County. I am. I mean, a preacher is just a professional hypocrite. But I have the awesome responsibility of telling you the best story I know, even if I don't live up to it. And I'll have to live with that sour taste of it in my mouth sometimes when I know I'm saying something that even I can't embody. But anyway, how do you know? Because at the end of this story, it says, when the wise men worship True worship, it says, they open. They open. I want to say a word about opening. And I'm not going to tell tales out of school. But i got to say something about being in this church. I've been in this church since October. And I have had the awesome privilege of being with a lot of people in important moments at the threshold of death. I, it's uncanny how many situations I've been in here where I've sat with people at death's door. Now, here's something I've learned, and I didn't know it before two months ago. You know, most of us just show each other our profiles. We show each other our Sunday best. We dress up, we try to look good, to show other people we're okay. But it's, there's a funny view you get when you sit with people and you're looking at someone's life and it's no longer in profile, now you're looking back over all of it. And it's a beautiful, crazy thing. Somehow in these conversations with people, you see that everyone had struggles and that that profile we showed to each other wasn't accurate and that there was no perfect family and perfect Baptist and perfect Christian and upstanding citizen and now you see you just get a hint and I don't mean this to sound harsh it's just the the funny in a way it's gracious to find the truth that oh they're no better than I am. But from that perspective, you see how messy and complicated people really are. And you know what that makes me think? It makes me think, how come or how can we have church where we are open? Could we be with each other in church in a way that wasn't just showing each other our profiles, our heroic profiles, but we could actually feel the grace of letting each other know who we really are in all our weaknesses, with the thorns in our flesh. That true worship, when you encounter God, it opens you. And then the other thing about true worship. At the end of the story, it says, They left 
to go to their homes, but what? By a different route. True worship changes you. You leave by a different route. Now, I got to stop because we got communion coming up. We're not done today. So now I just got to make a transition. This story beautifully prepares us for the Lord's Supper. Our, our worship service today is really our attempt to come and bow down before the Christ child. Just like the wise men did. Well, do you know that great communion hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together? How? On our knees. We're not even going to sing it. It would be perfect. But can you feel it? Come to this communion on your knees like the wise men. And then, one more thing. Think about the gifts the wise men pull from their thesauruses, their treasure chests. There's gold. That appeals to our sense of sight. There's frankincense. That appeals to our sense of smell. There's myrrh. In that lotion that appeals to our sense of touch. The scripture today is the gift to our sense of hearing. But what are we going to taste? The only sense we have not exercised yet in our service is the sense of taste. And now we add that to our worship. Taste and see that the Lord is good.